so yeah, so uh, after the operation, I remember sitting on the toilet, and it was night time, and and I did a fart, <laughs> and I ran out to the corridor, and I like fist pumped there, and was like, I farted, and like all the all the nurses like started clapping and cheering, and I was just. Went back into my room and I was like, God, this is bizarre. Like, this is so weird. Like, I just had a bunch of nurses yahooing me because I farted. I've got stage four bowel cancer. We're going to talk about everything from my diagnosis to treatment and how things are going right now. Talk about the things that people might be curious or want to hear, but are too frightened to ask. That's Joe McKenzie McLean, and I'm Colleen O'Hanlon. We've been mates and colleagues at Stuff for 20 years. Since her diagnosis, jo has been incredibly open about her illness on social media, and in this podcast, she wants to go further. So I'm just hoping that what we do here can just help people who are on that journey, whether they've got cancer or not, and make them feel that, you know, that they're not alone. I'm going to be with Jo every step of the way. There will be tears and laughter. She'll also offer practical insights, support and hope. This, then, is the story of Jo versus cancer. Right. Hi, Joe. Hi, Colleen. So last time we talked, we um, we had had you know a, quite a difficult conversation where you remembered you know that first night in hospital after being told you had cancer and a really um, personal and private moment you had with your partner Michael. Um, and then you wake up in the morning and you've got quite a different mindset already. Can we talk a bit more about that? Okay. So um, I ended up in Dunedin Hospital, obviously scheduled for emergency surgery to remove the tumour and it was really weird because um, my old flatmate from university happened to be the radiologist that saw, received my file and he came up to visit me in the room before my surgery and had said to me that, um, well he said liver is the best place to if, if it's going to spread to, um, you know, get cancer because it can regenerate and get chopped up and stuff and, you know. And then he also said that mindset plays a huge role in in how you recover and how you can try and get through this. So, I don't know, he just, what he said was just kind of like the right what I needed to hear at the right time. It was just it was just so weird that he was there. He had seen my file. He came up and it was just a really reassuring visit from someone who... He was gave it, your hope back, right? He did, yeah, he did. And I was like, right, okay, that's um, that's what I needed to hear. So I went into surgery and it was really funny because I was sitting on the table and they'd said, do you want, are you happy to have students in the room with you? And I was like, yeah, totally, I don't mind. And I'm from Southland, I'm quite a big girl, you know, I'm quite tall and big bones and I, I remember they were sitting around, standing around and uh, putting the drugs in and <laughs> <laughs> I feel a funny story it, was, it, it wasn't working and I said well you know I'm quite a big girl you're going you know need to sort of tranquilize me like an elephant you know it's, and they were talking to me and I think they were just trying to <laughs> obviously see if the drugs were working and to make conversation they had said oh do you um, have you been in hospital before? And I hadn't, you know, I'd never been in hospital except to have my children. I've been a healthy woman. And I said to them, oh, well, the last time I was in this hospital was to have my daughter, but I was in and out. She came out really quickly and I didn't even get admitted. Um, and then my words, I think, started <laughs> to slur. <laughs> my brain went somewhere else and I went, but it wasn't like when I had my son and he was born in Christchurch Hospital and that was a different story. And I said I was lying there and I'd had him and it was really painful and quite a... Um, yeah, different birth and my midwife had glasses on and I remember they were fogging up and she was dripping sweat on me and I'd made a joke about... Is this during the episiotomy? Yes, I'd, right. so yeah, I needed yeah. stitched. And anyway, she, yeah, she had done all that and then I'd made a joke about putting in an extra <laughs> stitch <laughs> as a joke. Anyway, six weeks later... 
you know, having a baby is painful. Yeah. And so it wasn't, I thought it was quite normal to have a sore private area, you know, so it was sore and I had this weird kind of discharge and the, <laughs> excuse me, sorry if this is, I'm an overshare. <laughs> this is, this is TMI, but we're also <laughs> here with you listening. <laughs> And I said, this is really painful. And she was like, don't worry, it's just a usual infection. And anyway, I ended up going to my GP in Christchurch because I I was having, when I went to the toilet, I felt like I was having a bit of a prolapse thing happening. So I went to the doctor and she examined me and said, that part is completely normal when you have a big baby, but your two vagina holes isn't normal. <laughs> Pardon me, and she goes, "You've got two vagina holes here. What? What has happened?" And I was like, "The crazy midwife." I said, "She like I had to have stitches when I had Travis, and um, she, but she misstitched. She, she misstitched, and um, because I'd waited so long, and it all fused healed. up. It had healed up, and um, anyway, long story short, I ended up going to my gynecologist and getting cut and fixed. So I know I, I don't have two vagina holes yeah. anymore. <laughs> But is this the story that you were telling sorry. the students oh, as you yeah. were going under? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. So <laughs> this story all came out. And the last thing I remember is them all laughing. And I Went blacked under. out. <laughs> and I, it wasn't until I woke up from surgery and, and sort of remembering everything. And I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, they must think I am a nutcase. I shared with them my two vagina hole story, which is now I'm sharing to the world. <laughs> But, you know. Yes. I don't know if there's ever a more Joe story than that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for the stories to come because I feel like that's 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 indicative of the kind of content we're oh, going to create. No. Yeah. But so, you know, that, I mean, that was kind of humorous, to be honest. And it, and I've kind of tried to keep that humour through. Light the moment. Light the moment for you. I mean, God, if you don't have a sense of humour, mm. it is... It's a it is a horrible place to be in, and you need and and that's been. I mean, I've always had a, a laugh, and I can laugh at myself and laugh at funny situations because there were quite a few in hospital. I found like uh, so after my surgery, um, you know, they the nurses had to, said to me, "Tell us when you do a fart." <laughs> and tell us when you do a poo because that good, means are they good things. They are great because that means the surgery has worked. Right. So, you know. Yeah, um, so, you know, when you have a baby, I don't know if anyone ever told you this, but you have a baby and it's like leave your dignity at the door yeah. and collect it on the way out. Is that um, is that very much true of, um, you know, this kind of surgery also, right? You know, because there's no confronting that um, you're dealing with, you know, bodily functions that lots of people are a little less than enthusiastic to talk about. Oh, Yeah. I know, like no one likes to talk about doing poos. Eh? Like that's <laughs> just gross. <laughs> but you just have to be. You just have to go with it. And, yeah. You know. You have to because, be zen with it being a topic of conversation. I know because, you know, usually like I don't even like doing a poo in a public toilet. You know, I'm quite private with my poo habits, and so I had to like just be like, right, okay, embrace it. This is important. It's health. It's important. Yeah, yeah. it's health. And I mean, this, that's the whole thing about bowel cancer, right? And colonoscopies, mm. like we said in the earlier episode, it's not pleasant. No one likes to go and have a camera <laughs> stick up their stuck up their bottom and whatnot. But it is. You need to talk about it. You need to talk about your mm. your bowel motions and your all of that stuff. And it just it's everyone has it, right? Mm. Everyone has to go to the toilet. Everyone has the same. Do you know when I had a <laughs> I had a colonoscopy? I think I was I had a baby. And, you know, like a no sleepy kind of baby. And, you know, it gets sedated or whatever. But my recollection is actually waking up after being sedated in a ward. Somebody's put a nice heated blanket over me. I'm super sleepy. I'm so tired. It's great that I can sleep with no baby. And then some lady comes over and goes, would you like a cup of tea and a little sandwich? And I'm like, oh, that sounds really nice. And it was the most like, – I remember it being very, like, like somebody was looking after me as a tired mum. Somebody was like snuggling me up in a bed and giving me a wee cup of tea and a small indulgence. It was so nice. Yeah. I, I remember thinking, I'd do this any day of the week. Yeah. You know, because I don't remember any of the actual procedure. Yeah. You know, but, um, and you can blank that out. But yeah, so our experiences of colonoscopy is perhaps different. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I didn't get one, so, you know. Oh, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly, yes. Um, but after. So, yeah, so after the operation, I remember sitting on the toilet and it was night time and, 
and I did a fart <laughs> and I ran out to the corridor and I like fist pumped there and was like, I farted. And like all the, all the nurses like started clapping and cheering and I was just went back into my room and I was like, God, this is bizarre. Like this is so weird. Like I just had a bunch of nurses yahooing me because I farted. They, oh, they're just sort of so funny. And um and and then the sort of same thing happened that when I when I'd done a poo, it was like very very exciting. So it was it, the op- operation worked, and so that was like tick tick right. That's good. The operation has worked. Progress, progress. And they had said to me, the quicker I get moving, the better it is. Yep. So I wasn't to lie down and sit around and mope around. So um, and the quicker, you know, I got moving, the faster the recovery would be, and that meant the quicker I could get onto chemotherapy yep. and treating And at this cancer. point, are you aware that um, time is of the essence? Yes. Like, do you know what stage your cancer is at, at this stage? You know um, you have it? Do you know how serious it is? Not really at that point. Yep. I just knew that getting off the bed was important. Yeah. And I was sort of just taking one thing at a time, yep. you know? I think my brain, I think your brain goes into some sort of autopilot I don't know whether it is a self-protection kind of thing that happens naturally, but I just remember being really focused on getting up off that bed mm. and getting moving and getting better, recovering from the operation. And so a couple of hours after my operation, you know, my partner was with me and he was like, right, come on, we need to get you up. You need to do a lap, just do one lap of the ward. And I was like, oh, I'm sore. Mm. I was really sore and I was... Um, you know, I could I couldn't really stand very well, and but you know, so we but I did it, and I walked around the ward. It took uh, half an hour. I was shuffling around, and um, but you know, I did it, and so that was another tick milestone. Yeah, and so I felt really good about that, and then, um, yeah. And so while this is happening, the kids are still with dad. Yes. Yeah. And so they they had come to vi- yeah they had come to visit me and. Um, and they'd gone by then, and so it was just me trying to recover from the surgery and um, dealing with that. And then the the surgeon came in the next day to see me, and she uh, explained that the tumour was really Complex. quite big, and she said that it um, nearly gave her a grey hair cutting it out. So two-thirds of my bowel was removed, and she said that it had... Um, she also removed blood vessels and lymph nodes. She, she explained it kind of like a big wedge of pizza. That, right. That, that is what had been taken out. In terms of size? Y- yeah. Like, right. Wow. And just shape as well. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Like that. Um, and so then con- the conversation turned to um, to the treatment for the cancer we you know the oncology and the, the the chemotherapy treatment and we said well where to what do we do now what, what do we where do we go from here and they said have you got insurance and thankfully I have insurance through work um, so that meant instead of having to wait four months to get an oncologist which is what I was told I could see an oncologist pretty much as soon as I was healed from the surgery. So th- oh, four months it feels like a life changing yeah. amount of time to wait. Oh, I can't imagine mm. it. And, that, and so that's what people are doing; they're having to wait. And I didn't realise it at the time, but it was an important question that I asked. And I said to there are people sort of coming in and out, but I said to somebody, "What do I do about the kids? Like, is there someone that can help me? What do I say to the kids? How do I deal with the children? What do I say? Is there any help here?" And a lady came in and the conversation was a bit, it was helpful, but not, you know. But generic or like, yeah, you know. and mm. she, um, yeah, I mean, I just recovered from surgery. I was quite dopey. I was on some heavy medication and it was all getting a little bit overwhelming. But, you know, I, I, had, I did have a conversation with her and I didn't know how important that would be at the time, but... Um, because I'm having private insurance covering my treatment, it meant, it meant that I actually ended up missing out on a lot of public, public health services. services. So can you not, not can you not 
double dip? As far as I know, you're, no. You're on one path or the other. Yeah, you cannot mix. Right. So, but skipping forward a, a bit, you know, down the track recently, I have had a counsellor been um, assigned to me through the public system, but I was told the only reason that happened is because I asked about the children when I had surgery through the public system. My, wow. my surgery was given to me through the public. So, and yeah. you asked about the children yeah. then? So that meant it was on record, and so I was able to... But it I, took all that time for it to happen. And the, the, the way it happened too was weird, because the only reason it happened was because mum had, had back surgery, and she had been... Um, assign some care and mum is my a lot. caregiver yeah she hel- she has helped me a lot you know she is my primary between her and my partner and my stepdad you know they all they all help but um, and she was worried about how she was going to help me because she was out of action after her back operation and so she she asked so through her asking somebody through the public health system they contacted me and I explained my situation but yeah but I wasn't entitled to any any help for say, like cleaning or cooking. They told me that I'd have to access my social contacts. All oh, um, right, so tap your network. Yes, to, for help. But yeah. I was allowed a, a counsellor because I had asked for it in the public system. So yeah, right. sorry, that's skipping ahead a bit. But mm. I think that's important to know, and I think it's, um, I think it's a real gap in the system. I think that when you are in hospital the pathway and support post-operation is an uh, absolute <laughs> void. <laughs> and also and not everybody has that network to tap. You know, like no. you're lucky you came from, a, you know, one thing as somebody who doesn't live in the same place, it's been so obvious how your Cromwell community has absolutely rallied around you, right? But you're a, you know, a larger-than-life personality, you're kind of magnetic person people are drawn to, you've got lots of friends, you make those contacts easily. That is not everybody's reality, you know, so the idea that, you know, tap your social contacts, well, for a lot of people, that circle could be incredibly small. And the only reason I have private insurance, it's not because I'm wealthy and rich, it's just because through work I thankfully have it, and so that allowed me to get, quicker treatment than otherwise, mm. you know, and, but it doesn't mean, you know, for example, I have to travel to Dunedin every fortnight for treatment. So through the public system, you get a transport allowance. Yep. I don't. Yeah, right. Because I'm private. So I pay two, about, it's about $200. Petrol's expensive. So I pay to go to Dunedin every fortnight for my treatment. And there are costs, you know, yep. like there's things that people in the, private system are denied because they um, mm. yeah, aren't in the public system. But, you yeah, know, that's... That's interesting, right, to see, like, um, private might have got you somewhere faster, but it also shut the door to other benefits that you... The door was shut to those things before you even knew there was a door. Yeah. Right? And things like um, referrals. Mm. So when I left the hospital... Um, I didn't have at the hospital I was sort of surrounded by doctors surrounded by nurses and then you leave the hospital and it's like you're on your own kind of like what you said like having a baby eh? yeah. like you have a baby and you leave hospital and suddenly you've got this baby at home you're like holy oh, crap what do I do so I went home and it's like I had this bloody demon baby cancer like with me and I was like what do I do with this thing like what do I what am I doing so yeah how do I how do I tell the kids and and what does lie ahead for me what do I what do I tell the kids yeah you know so can we talk about that conversation so that so that happened pretty quickly after I returned home so I got home pretty quickly because I was walking around by the time I left day three they were like you can go home you're you're doing really well that's so that was great so I I came home I had a chat with my ex-husband and said he he was quite adamant that we needed to tell the kids sooner rather than later because we were scared that I live in a small community and we were scared that the kids would find out through somebody else which was highly Mm -hmm. likely so when I got home him and I sat in the garden and had the kids there 
Travis was hanging from a tree, playing in the tree. It was a hot day. Um, it was January, you know, and summer in central Otago. Morgan was had an ice block and they were just running around the backyard. And I, I said, oh, you know, we, we've got to talk to you about something. And um, and I just said, I just said, my the doctors did the operation and I've I've got cancer. I just came out with it like that. I just said, oh, I've got cancer. And Morgan, Travis didn't really say anything, but Morgan kind of went, oh, and then she said, um, you're, you're going to die. She immediately connected cancer with death. And I said, no, no. Um, I said, no one has said that I'm going to die. And I said, they, they've they removed the tumour and it's spread. It's in my liver too, so I'm going to need some treatment on my liver and and I started talking about how pe- other people around us have had cancer and survived. So yeah. their nana has had breast cancer and she survived. My neighbour has had cancer, he survived. My other neighbour has had cancer and he survived. You know, and I explained lots and lots of people have have had cancer and they and they live through it. And I said, you know, we've got lots of the doctors have said there's lots of tools in the toolbox. Um, to, to treat this, so we just have to believe that there's tools that are going to help treat this. So that's kind of basically what I said. It sounds like um, you had a very managed to have quite a matter of fact conversation about a really difficult topic. Like yeah. you, even you know, as a parent, you're thinking about how how their what it must feel like to be them right in that moment, and that you're trying to deliver this awful news in a way that is as gentle as possible. Yep. Um, but you must have been feeling on the inside, yeah. you know you're breaking something in their little hearts, right? You know, that oh. it's a burden for them. The build-up to telling them was horrendous. You know, I was, um, if you could have, if, if what you could see on the outside what was happening on the inside, you know, I was, um, you know, I wanted to vomit and, and and faint, but I was really trying to keep it together. You know, I've really yeah. got to just put myself in a in a space where right, I've got to keep it together and um, be strong. They need to see me as being strong and having the mindset that we are going to um, do everything that we can to to beat this. And mm. you know, like I could even say to them, you know, I'm a reporter, so I've interviewed a lot of people. And a lot of people who have had stories where they've overcome adversity. Yeah. Yeah. And I have got one person who, you know, I actually look to as my hope and she lives in Cromwell. I interviewed her probably, I don't know, six years ago and she had bowel cancer, stage four bowel cancer. And, um, there's no evidence of cancer in, in her body. Like she, she has... I, I don't. She's you know, on the other she, side. Yeah, I mean, I don't really want to talk about her yeah. her her medical thing, but as far as I know, she's in remission. Um, she's and she is living, yeah, living her life quite normally and has overcome it. So, um, if as far as I'm concerned, I can say to my children and I can t- say to myself, well, here is someone that I've actually interviewed. I've met. She's a young mum and she has yeah. the same cancer as me and she has um, overcome it. So yeah. there's in my mind. What I'm telling the kids is what I'm telling myself. And so I am just like, other people can do it, I can do it too. So there might not be many of them, yeah. <laughs> but they are out there. And I've had that conversation with the Cancer Society, um, this, the, the Cancer Society lady from Otago who's reached out to me. And she we've talked about it, you know, and she has said that they're on the ground every day. They see, they see hundreds of people and... We don't hear about them, but she does. They do, and they 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 run into, into people in the supermarket. The or, survivor stories, you yeah, mean? The yeah, the survivor stories. Yeah. So you don't yeah. unless you hear about them. Yeah, it's it, it, and it's hard to hear about them. It's like this sort of underground group that they're out there. But well, I guess it's where because, are they? It's, it's because they've they've never had a funeral. You know, like so in some yeah. ways that they're continuing on as normal, right? But when somebody isn't as lucky, there's an event. That marks that, and that's how we know about those stories. Yeah. I mean, the same is not necessarily true for survivors. Um, do you, um, you know, I kind of think, um, look, reflect back upon times that I might have had to give my own children hard news or live through scary things. Like, um, 
like earthquakes. And I remember my own fear being so um, overwhelming, like overwhelmingly frightened myself um, and recognising in my children that my fear was the most frightening thing for them, you know. So when you're telling your kids about this really scary problem in your life, um, I super admire that you're able to keep your shit together in that moment because it's really hard when it's um, literally a matter of life and death, right, and that you can still, in those circumstances, put your own kids first, you know, and, and keep it together. Well, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to protect them and I'm trying to make life as normal as possible. And, yeah, I don't want to frighten them. I don't That's want it. them to see my fear. So I am just doing my best. And it's really weird because I told the kids and they're young, you know, they're, they're at the minute they're 9 and 12 and I'm not sure if that's just normal kid behaviour but they kind of seem to accept the news and then carry on playing. And I was kind of like, oh, that was oh. easy. <laughs> when, when, <laughs> I was like, I was expecting so I don't know, I thought like no, it was no. good. And I was like, hmm, kids are kind of like. I remember when <laughs> my husband and I, my husband at the time sat our kids down to say, Mum and Dad are going to separate. Um, and we took them out for ice cream, as you do. And I said, okay, kids, so, you know, here's the thing. Mum and Dad have decided that actually Dad's going to dad's gonna live in his own place, that actually we're happier when we don't live together. And, you know, I kind of gently delivered the news, and then I was like, is there any questions? And two hands went up. The boys went up. Hands went up. Henry's was, will Dad have Wi-Fi? <laughs> and James's hand went down because that was his question too. And that was, you know, and then it was a really, um, like, matter-of-fact approach to it, you know, in some yeah. ways. And then yeah. there, there are obviously other questions that came up later that percolated to the surface or whatever. But in that moment, it was a, like a – they don't seem to enjoy dramatic moments either, you know. They just want to absorb the news and then kind of deal with it in their own way. But I do remember being really taken aback by just how it was like, cool, I guess we'll finish the flake 99 then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of reminds me of – you know, because I've had some fundraising done for me for my drug treatment, and Travis has said to me, um, "Oh, if there's any money left over from the cancer <laughs> fund when you're better, can I buy a motorbike?" <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, um, "Yeah, no." <laughs> but I think that it, that shows me that they see the other side. Yeah, they they don't. I don't think they get how serious it is. I've told them what they need to know. Yep. And I've and you know, and I have tried to normalize it as much as possible, you know. I've actually taken them to my treatment. They've come to Dunedin with me and sat with me while I've had chemo and they have met the nurses. They've met the oncologist, Chris Jackson. Um just because, you know, I talk about them all the time. I'm going there every fortnight and I just wanted them to to see where I was going and see that it wasn't actually a scary place mm. and that I am being looked after really well by a really um, caring team of people. And that really helped. That well, maybe the fear of not knowing what's happening and that mum disappears and the unknown is happening and we don't know, but it's a scary topic and therefore no knowledge is scary knowledge. But maybe demystifying it a bit for yep. them is actually a helpful approach. My son is quite quiet and sometimes I worry about what is going on in mm. his head and how much he's absorbing because my kids listen a lot to things and sometimes they I think, do oh my god blighters. yeah and I think, <laughs> have I said too much in front of them or what have they heard mm. and so I, I'm not sure how much they actually ha ha have heard and absorbed. Pieced together. Yeah and because there has been a couple of moments where we've been driving, I remember one time I was driving with the kids to um, Alexandra or something and I was with my mum and Travis just out of nowhere said mum what what happens if the drugs don't work mm. and I was taken back and we were all silent and I didn't know what to say and to be honest I can't even remember what I said um, but I remember like my eyes were stinging and I was trying to hold back tears and yeah, I, I actually can't remember what I said, but I, th I think it was probably s something like they're going to work or yep. there'll, there'll be something else. Or there'll be a different one or, or something, yep. try something else, yep. something like that. Which is what I have to tell myself too, mm. you know. I don't know how many drugs are out there, but I will be trying every single drug there is and every single treatment there is, whether it means I have to travel to Blimmin, I don't know. 
Norway <laughs> or <laughs> South Africa. I don't know where there's treatment being done, but we'll, we will look into every possible um, every option. option. Yeah, so that's what I am telling the kids and telling myself. So, But, yeah, the kids are good. The kids have been really great. Like They've, they've had to help me. Um, you know, there's, with the side effects of some of the drugs that I've been on, I haven't been able to move my body properly, so they've had to help dress me some days, or my um, I've had really sore feet that I've had to uh, rub cream in, and my udder cream. Udder cre- it is called udder cream. <laughs> I was like, "What the hell?" Udder cream for your feet. What's in it? What's the magic sauce? <laughs> oh, I'll have to bring some. I don't know, but yeah, it really works. They and they've specifically said get this udder cream. And it's got a picture of a cow on it. So it's not like it's a medical version of it. It is actually just the product for cows. You get, no, for farmers, the hands. Oh, I see. I thought it was for the udders, but it's for the farmer's hands on the udders. Yes. (laughs) I think so. (laughs) That makes more sense. I need to check that out. (laughs) But, yeah, it's, um, but it works. Yeah, but they've rubbed it in and, you know, um, yeah. But there's days that... uh, you know, Travis has wanted me to go out and do basketball shoots with him and I can't and Morgan's wanted me to do netball shots with her and I can't and there's days that I have cried in front of them yeah. and days that I've broken down and they've seen it and... Um, but, you know, Joe, I don't have cancer and there are days my daughter asks me to go and do herps with her and I can't. I'm too tired from just life, you know, or the days that the kids ask me to do something and I just take her swimming and I just can't because I'm tired. So... I feel like it's very easy for you to feel extra bad for those things that you feel you can't do with your kids when actually life is just hard. You're a single parent. It's hard. It's exhausting anyway. We can't do all the things all the time, you know, and I think you're quite diff- you're quite tough on yourself in those spaces. I understand why, but I do think you are. Yeah, sometimes I guess I do have to try and remind myself that even if I didn't have cancer... You're doing the job of two parents a lot of the time. It would be like, yeah. Mm. And sometimes I can't do the things that the kids want me to do. But I, I think... Sometimes but, I can't be asked doing the things <laughs> the kids want me to do. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's also a true true story. <laughs> <laughs> so I, Sometimes I'm so tired that, Oh, mum sat there the other day and she said, oh, you're such a good mum. But the thing was, I was so tired and I sat there and Morgan has been watching YouTube videos and wants to do makeup. And, you know, mm-hmm. I feel like I have to entertain the kids a lot. And I feel, you know, I do what I can because I can't, I can't run and do things like I used to. I can't take them for bike rides and I can't yep. do that. But, you know, Morgan likes doing makeup. So that's something that I can do. So I literally just sit in a chair and let them just go to town on my face. And so this one day Travis had, they drew a line down my face and Travis had one half and Morgan had the other and they just completely make up my face. But And I just sat there and let them do it and um, sometimes I just let them do whatever they want. And I sort of, yeah. It must I, be I, so nice to hear your mum say you're a great mum. Because well, all, don't we yeah. as all parents think ultimately we're doing a shit job? <laughs> Well, you yeah. know what I mean, like yeah, yeah, it's an yeah. eternal parent thing, right? Yeah. You always think you could be doing more, doing it better, whatever. You, you, there's no like finish line where you know suddenly that you're an amazing parent, you know. Yeah. So hearing that directly from your mum that you're doing a great job, Joe. Yeah. I think is quite meaningful. And, uh, well, it has stuck with me. I guess I did mm. sort of think, well, you know, I'm doing the best I can, because which is I, awesome. Sometimes I do, because I've got cancer. I feel like I give the kids a bit of a longer rope than what they usually would have. You know, I, I'm kind of like. Does that mean you don't sweat the small stuff type? I'm trying not to. Yeah. yeah, they can be quite messy and they can be doing more to help me. And I and I think that and, and they and they want they ask me for things and I'm giving them to them. Yeah. A lot more than possibly what I would have otherwise and some But they're yeah. not you're not I don't think that sounds like um you're creating lifelong bad habits in your children that they can get what they want without you know what you're really trying to do is avoid everyday conflict with your children and have good times with them, not shitty ones. Yeah. In ways that are, you know, they're not um, they're not really, you know, if you're letting your kids not tidy their room on a Saturday morning or whatever, that's not really going to change the outcome of the, your parenting in terms of what kind of adult they grow up to be. Yeah. Yep, that's right. And my counsellors reinforce that. So I... <laughs> 
I'm, I'm like, it's good. <laughs> I've got an alternative <laughs> career path. Just waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have. I have got a counsellor that I talk to about some of these things. So, mm. um, yeah, I think the important things are, you know, I give them cuddles at night, and um, yeah, we hug a lot and and play music and laugh and just yeah, try and just Great. try and love. Create positive core memories. Yeah. <laughs> You've been listening to Joe versus Cancer with Joe McKenzie McLean and me, Colleen O'Hanlon. We know our conversations might be a tough listen, whether you've got cancer or you're caring for somebody who has. There's lots of support available and there's information in the show notes. This is a stuff podcast produced by Chris Reed. You can listen to the full series at stuff.co.nz or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. Kia kaha. Be strong.